Intrauterine insemination is the topic of today's podcast. Proudly, I was the person that introduced intrauterine insemination with washed and capacitated sperm into the field of infertility almost 40 years ago. Intrauterine insemination is often misused. There are many misconceptions, to use a pun, about its use. And today we're going to clear all that up. So those of you that are interested, please watch this podcast closely. Welcome to the Egg Whisperer Show, a program exclusively designed to promote reproductive health awareness and discuss fertility preservation options. Here is your host, the Harvard-educated fertility specialist, Dr. Amy. She's known as the Egg Whisperer. Fertility expert, Dr. Amy Lazadin. And you have yet another success story just launched by an East Bay fertility doctor. Welcome to the Egg Whisperer Show. I have the legend, the most famous IVF doctor in the whole world, Dr. Jeffrey Scher on today. And I'm so honored to have you back. Thank you for joining us again. Oh, it's my great pleasure. And I have the honor of calling you Jeff. So if you don't mind, everyone. Oh, you will, he, please. He is that. Jeff to me. I am so fortunate. Um, but let me just tell you guys a little bit about uh, Dr. Scher. So he's an internationally renowned expert in the field of assisted reproductive technology influential in the births of over more than 17,000 IVF babies over the last 35 years. And I imagine you go places and people are like, Dr. Cher, Dr. Cher. And then you say things like, I knew you when you were one centimeter. <laughs> That's true. That's true. And you know, a lot of cool things about you. I mean, one of them is that you helped fashion the entire field of ART. And after training under the fathers of IVF, doctors, pets, Patrick Steptoe and Robert Edwards, you established the first private IVF program in the United States in 1982 with your partner, Dr. Ganima Maserani. And you then went on to open 10 more IVF centers throughout the U.S., most recently culminating in Share Fertility Solutions. And that's kind of how I interact a lot with you. And my patients have benefited so much from the consult you. you had related to reproductive immunology. And then you have offices in Las Vegas and New York City, but obviously patients who are, you know, talking to you don't necessarily have to go there unless they're doing IVF with you. You've also authored more than 200 articles in several books, most recent of which is Recurrent Pregnancy Loss and Unexplained IVF Failure, the Immunologic Link, and you offer that free of charge downloaded from your website, share, S-H-E-R-I-V-F.com, and you can also call Dr. Share's office, 702-533-2691, and I'm going to have this blog article written up to go with this podcast or however you're listening to this. So for people who want to also read all this information and go back to it, you guys certainly can. So Jeff, without further ado, let's talk about today's topic and sure. let's get started. Can you just tell us what is IUI? Break it down for our listeners. To put it in perspective, people in the, in the last century, up until the eighties used to do intravaginal insemination of whole sperm. And it was effective if the ma if woman was fertile, the man was fertile, there were good results, as, as good or as bad as natural conception, which is about 20% per month of trying. Then they moved on to trying to use only the semen or the sperm part of the semen specimen. And as you know, semen comprises 98% milky fluid or the plasma and 2% sperm. So the idea was to inject a small amount of the semen, which is sperm and milky fluid into the uterus. So doctors would inject 0.2 cc's of whole sperm into the uterus with disastrous effects. The results were terrible. Women got very sick because as you know, semen contains prostaglandins. And when you inject this into the uterine cavity, there's a violent reaction in many cases. Some women even died from a type of an anaphylactic response. It was quickly discarded as an option. And then there was the idea, which is something proudly I came up with in 1982, along with a guy who since has passed at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, Luther Talbot. He was the first board certified RE in the, in the United States. And Luther and I developed this technique of intrauterine insemination. 
So you're telling me that I'm actually talking to the guy who set up the first IVF practice in the United States and did the first intrauterine insemination washing sperm to make we, pregnancy safer for women? We published the first I, paper ever on intrauterine insemination in the journal Fertility and Sterility back in 1983-84. And what I did was I said we were starting IVF at that time. I just come back from Steptoe. We were doing IVF and I said, look, for IVF, you need to get the sperm, separate the semen, the plasma from the sperm, incubate the sperm, and then fertilize the eggs. In those days, we didn't have ICSI. We weren't injecting sperm into eggs. We were just in putting sperm in the environment, eggs in the environment of the sperm. And so I decided what I'd do is do exactly the same thing. And we would basically take sperm uh, that was separated from the seminal plasma by spinning it down through centrifugation. And then we incubated it. We thought the incubation would enhance a process we call capacitation, which lifts the little helmet off the top of the sperm's head, exposing the enzymes and enables the sperm to fertilize the egg better. So using washed, incubated, capacitated, in vitro capacitated sperm, we, uh, we started to do a study. And we started doing this in all comers that had normal ovulation and had men with various forms of normal versus abnormal sperm function. What we found immediately was that there was really no benefit in doing intrauterine insemination when there was significant male infertility. The results were no better than not doing intrauterine insemination. There was no benefit in doing intrauterine insemination if the woman had endometriosis. We can discuss this later. There's a really physiological reason why that's the case, because most of the problems with endometriosis occur through a toxic environmental pelvic factor. So as the sperm passes from the ovary to the tube, it crosses through an environment where these deposits release toxins, and this reduces the ability of the egg to accept the sperm. The receptors, the ZP receptors on the sperm surface are blocked, and so the sperm can't easily get into the egg. So um, it doesn't work there. And we found also that in older women, and this is something that uh, Ricardo Ash, who no, no longer practices in the IVF field, I believe in this country, uh, published on, and that is that women over 40 have a very, very low success rate with IUI. In fact, if the woman is over 40, between 40 and 44, the pregnancy rate was about 50, one in 50, whereas if the woman was over 45, it was one in 100. So with those exceptions, you don't do intrauterine insemination preferentially if there is endometriosis of any severity. IVF is the only way to bypass the toxic pelvic environment. You don't do it in older women and you don't do it in cases of male infertility because you're kidding yourself. The results are no better. So when you do it in other cases delivered basically to pass a cervical factor, like if the cervical mucus is hostile and you have to pass the catheter into the uterus to deliver the sperm, it has a benefit. You can do it in unexplained, quote, quote, infertility, which is rarely unexplained, but unexplained. Then you get reasonably good results. And you can do it in women with normal ovarian reserve. Those with lower ovarian reserve really don't have the time to waste on lesser procedures. And when you do this, in these women, then the pregnancy rates, basically, with the exception of cases such as PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, where the woman releases a lot of eggs at one time, you usually get pregnancy rates that will approach what you get under optimal circumstances with natural conception. So intrauterine insemination is good, but it's not good if it's misused and it's a misconception that it works well in those cases that I mentioned that have bad results. It also doesn't work nearly as well if you use clomiphene citrate, because when you stimulate the woman with clomid or seraphine, you are introducing an anti-estrogen. And the, the normal pregnancy rates are about a third lower for any woman taking clomid than the natural conception for her age. If she's obviously ovulating herself and you're trying to super ovulate her, obviously it works well for women that aren't ovulating because you're making them ovulate with the clomiphene, so you improve the results. 
but it doesn't do very well for uh, for uh, ovulating women. It's better to use um, gonadotropins to prepare for the IUI, and you get better results that way. Yeah, I mean, what I would say is, I agree with you, but what I don't understand is why is there this misconception out there that IUI is amazing and it fixes everything and people actually come in, they're like, I'm ready, I wanna do IUI. Why do you think there's this misunderstanding when I tell people, well, your pregnancy rate's gonna be around 10% with IUI, maybe maximum 15% based on your age. Why is there this disconnect out there? Because a lot of doctors don't do IVF and there's the misconception amongst patients that using fertility drugs and then insemination will give them the edge. And many doctors who don't do IVF offer their patients IUI. The big tragedy, in my opinion, is that oftentimes such women delay doing IVF. And in the process, their ovarian reserve declines, the biological clock advances, and they don't get pregnant. But there's a really, really important concept here that I'd like to share with, with your listeners that they don't often get told. Here's the reason why if you do IUI or you use fertility drugs in women, you don't, let me repeat again, you don't get increased incidences of multiple births unless the woman is not ovulating normally. And the reason is that ovulating women may produce a lot of follicles that develop in the early stage of stimulation. One leads the way, it's a dominating follicle, it's a, the process of selection to dominance. And then from that point onwards, under continued stimulation, that follicle will go on to ovulate. The others are still there, but they don't grow as fast. And the moment the first follicle has released the egg, the others stop dead in their tracks. They involute and you lose those follicles, which is why we did a study on this, why when you do IUI with fertility drugs, in women who are not ovulating, you increase the pregnancy rate. In women like women with PCOS, you can get pregnancy rates of 30%. But if you do IUI with fertility drugs in women that are ovulating, the pregnancy rate is the same and there's no increase in multiple birth rates. The only time you see increased incidence of multiple birth rates is when the woman is producing large numbers of follicles, there's no dominant follicle, you stimulate and they all rush to the finish line together and release their eggs. And then you end up with multiples, but not for normal ovulating women who get IUI and fertility drugs. You don't get an increased incidence of twins or triplets. And I think right now with COVID, a lot of people are just so stressed out about even having sex. So sometimes IUI can help with that. I mean, I think yes. there's, you know, I always say you can, Take it out of the bedroom and just bring it here <laughs> and i'll make your sperm sparkle and we'll do your iui but at the same time patients just really need to know what their chances are so that if it's something doesn't work they're not going to feel misled or misguided or you know extremely upset i mean it's always upsetting when something doesn't work but if you go in saying okay most people who do this treatment they're not going to be successful it's just part of human biology when it doesn't work you know i think that counseling up front is really helpful i think that's very important i think it's important for people to avoid the misconception that iui is this miracle procedure that's going to increase their pregnancy rates above the normal it may do that if they're not ovulating as i said or they're ovulating abnormally but not for normal normally ovulating women and women that are older above 40 and or women that are younger with diminishing ovarian reserve or when there's significant male infertility or in cases of um, um, the uh, woman's ovarian reserve declining, IUI is not a treatment of choice. Yeah. And in fact, there's no great advantage if a man's got normal sperm, washing the sperm and injecting it either. It just is more convenient. You can target the timing of ovulation and get it done. It's a good procedure but it's overused, misused, and there are many misconceptions about it. And I think that's a great point that a lot of doctors that do it, for example, are general OBGYNs, and they can't do IVF. So patients are kind of stuck in that treatment type because they aren't counseled appropriately about what their, their diagnosis is, what their prognosis is, and what treatments they can do that'll give them a higher chance. And they might not understand that they don't have as high of a chance that they thought they did. 
So I'm pretty stubborn. And what I mean by that is, you know, sometimes I, you know, I, I'll see a patient and, um, you know, I feel like in my gut, I'm like, I, I should work for this person. And let's say they're resistant to IVF. I've actually done six IUIs, nine IUIs, 13 IUIs. And the number of IUIs that I've done for one couple is 23. And I have 23 gray hairs for all it's of them. Lot. It's a lot. I'm the godmother of their child. Her picture, it's an oil painting, sits on <laughs> above my fireplace. Um, but yeah, so I mean, it's a lot. But those, that's only like four scenarios of where I've gone past maybe three or four IUIs. And literally, I can count four and that's it. But I see patients sometimes they, they've done like 12 IUIs. Oh, yeah. And I'm just like, wow. And, and they just, and it's not because they weren't educated people. It's because they weren't given options. So thank you for, for telling it's us. It's a pleasure. There's another one thing also. Yeah. In my experience, doing IUI using normal sperm in a woman that's ovulating, um, but doing it in a natural cycle doesn't really improve the chance of pregnancy. So I avoid and recommend strongly against what so many doctors do do sadly, and that's repeatedly do IUIs and natural cycles offering false hope of an improved chance of pregnancy. Yeah, pregnancy may occur, it can occur after 45 IUIs, but it probably would have occurred anyway. So it's, 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 it's just a question of being selective and uh, having your patients understand the odds. The greatest travesty of all, as I said earlier, is watching people go through repeated IUIs when you know they need IVF and you're wasting valuable time that many cannot afford to waste. And I think a lot of it sometimes is the misconceptions associated with IVF, you know, and people are so afraid. So I just want to implore people out there to talk to an IVF doctor and we're all IUI doctors as well to really dig into the reasons why you're having trouble conceiving. So you guys can come up with a really great plan with a wonderful doctor like Dr. Cher. Jeff, is there anything else you want to add about IUI for our listeners? It's a wonderful procedure done correctly for the right patient. It's often overused, shouldn't be used in certain cases, but it is something that I think benefits a lot of patients if done correctly. And make sure your tubes are open. Oh, thank you. Don't, and I've seen so many patients that have gone through IUI only to be found later to have blocked tubes. And with blocked tubes, women should always realize the commonest cause of blocked tubes is inflammation, endosalpingitis. So if one tube's affected, even if the other one's open, it doesn't mean it's normal. Usually it's the reverse. The other one, it's usually an, uh, uh, an equal opportunity problem. So yes, make sure there was been, there's been no history of uh, pelvic inflammatory disease with self angitis. I joke and I say that when I'm older, not quite, because I don't want to be like the crazy old lady with bumper stickers all over her car, but that's one of the bumper stickers I want on my car. If one tube is blocked, please assume that the other tube is affected is by the same thing. Please don't waste time doing IUI after IUI. In some cases, certainly, you know, you could get pregnant, but if it's very obvious that you're not, don't waste your time. Okay. That's a very good message. Very yeah. good message. Make that bumper stick. I will. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for talking about IUI today. Learn so much every time I have you on. Will you come back another time and maybe we'll talk about IVF protocols or endometriosis? Be delighted. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. Welcome to the Egg Whisperer Show, a program exclusively designed to promote reproductive health awareness and discuss fertility preservation options. Here is your host, the Harvard-educated fertility specialist, Dr. Amy. She's known as the Egg Whisperer. Fertility expert, Dr. Amy Vazadeh. And you have yet another success story just launched by an East Bay fertility doctor. 